wonderful to see so many faces here, unmasked, and um, yeah, enjoying the polar bear weather. Wonderful. God's brought the rain again, and we indeed want to see the rain of His Spirit again. Amen. This morning, I'd just like to welcome everybody. Visitors, you're very welcome. And uh, yeah, stay behind afterwards and get to know us a bit better. See if you like what you see. And uh, the regulars, lovely to see you all. And for those who couldn't make it online, we pray that you're well in the Lord. Amen. As a call to worship this morning, I just want to read uh, the psalm. I just find the psalm so wonderfully relaxing. Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and flute. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? While we're still breathing, we're still on this earth, let us praise the Lord together. Amen? So open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your wonderful, Lord, plan of salvation for us. Lord, only you could have thought of something so great, Lord. We, we accept this miracle of salvation, Lord. It is ours. It is a gift, Lord, given to us. Lord, and who are we to turn away a gift? So we just thank you, Lord, that you are with us every day by your spirit, that you lead us and you guide us. You comfort those in mourn, Lord. You're with the sick. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that your hand, we know your hand is not too short to heal those who cannot be here today, Lord. Those who are ailing, those who are sick. We just pray for them all, Lord. We pray, Lord, for the service. We pray that every aspect of the service, Lord, would bring glory to your name. Pray for the preaching of your word, Lord. I pray that your, your spirit would work mightily through Pastor Kevin, Lord, that we may have ears to hear what, you have to, what the word has to say to us today, Lord. Pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. <laughs>
Full of faith, our lips full of praise. 
The next event is the following Saturday, the 10th of September, and that is a mountain picnic. We mountain view, right? So we have to throw in some sort of mountain. <laughs> Um, this event, um, Adam Hewitt is going to be arranging. What it entails is us hiking up to Elephant Eye from Silver Mine Nature Reserve. Beautiful, right? Um, the only cost involved is your entry to get into the reserve. We will give you details closer to the time in terms of times and where to meet. And then we are going to be having a picnic after the hike down by the dam. So basically, you bring anything that you would like to have. Um, yeah, so that's the mountain picnic. Then, the 17th, the following Saturday, so three Saturdays in a row, right? This is the 17th. This is a very special event. This is a celebration dinner held here, a formal sit-down event. Um, it is going to mean that we do some time travel back from 2023 to 1923. Um, it is going to involve dress up in 1920s style clothes. Lots of glitz, lots of glamour, things, flappers, that kind of thing, taking us right back to when the building was completed. Mm. That celebration dinner um, is going to be a two course meal together with tea and coffee and all your drinks thrown in. It's 200 Rand per head. Um, tickets will go on sale from next week. Mommy will be selling these. If you cannot afford the ticket, please don't feel that you can't come. Please speak to us. We will make a plan for you. And by the same token, if you are able to sponsor a ticket or two, please let us know. Right, that's a celebration dinner, please. There are limited tickets for that event. If you do intend to come, please don't delay in booking. Okay, those tickets are going to go fast. Back to my flyer here. So after the celebration dinner, the next weekend. Okay, so we've got super games. We've got a mountain picnic. We've got the 1920 celebration dinner, and then the 24th is Heritage Day. And what better way to celebrate our heritage and our heritage in Christ and the ministry that's happening in this building? Mm -hmm. So now that will be a birthday party. So the formal sit down dinner is probably a bit more for adults. The church birthday party is for everyone, but it, there definitely will be a family focus. That will be held here at the office, weather permitting. And there is the jumping castles, candy blocks, popcorn, face painting, loads of fun and games, a colouring in competition, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, we'll let you know closer to the time with a few more details about that. Okay, so all your Saturdays so far for September are booked. But just in case you had any other space in September, we have also got what we call the 100 Smiles Outreach. Now for those of you who don't know, this building came about as a result of a thriving Sunday school ministry to the Westgate community. And particularly Westgate kids would come here, and the building was essentially built for that purpose, for a Sunday school. So we thought how appropriate it would be to give back to the Westgate community, and particularly to the children. Mm -hmm. So the 100 Smiles Outreach, this initiative basically involves, it's like the Santa shoebox kind of idea, where we have 100 gifts that we're going to be making up to be distributed to those kids in Westbank. Mm. Uh, we will give you details closer to the time of the things that we're going to be collecting for each of these gifts, but they're going to be um, exactly the same, all 100 of them, and there's a few key items that we need. So if you are able to donate items, we'll let you know in time what those are. Um, Maureen is going to be handling that, um, so yeah, we'll let you know closer to the time of what we need. And then to top it all off, we will be having on the 25th of September, the last Sunday of September, we're going to have a special centenary service here in the church. And we're going to be inviting people who have been part of the church, both currently and both historically, to hear a bit more about their stories and their testimonies and the ministry that happened from this building. Mm -hmm. um, so Uncle Isaac's been working hard in terms of putting together history on this and finding out information, so yeah, it's going to be fascinating, and I think it's going to be a real god horrifying event. So, there you have it. As I said, the month of September, you're busy. <laughs> Please join us for these events. We're very excited about fellowshipping with you, and that's yeah, a, a wonderful opportunity to celebrate God's greatest to us. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank Amen. you. Thank you. Pray for which I'm going to pray for. I just want to 
want to make a special mention of uh, Tish Hollis now. Um, is in hospital at the moment. She's actually going to be with us. Uh, she's, they moved up to Longabond and they were coming down today, especially to come and join uh, us this morning. But uh, she has come down with, with poor health and has been admitted into hospital. And uh, for those who heard her putting on a ventilator, so uh, let's just remember Tish in all our, our prayers and for Andre as well and for the whole family. Let's, let's go. <coughs> Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to work. And we've just heard about some of the activities we're going to be uh, doing to somehow commemorate, to remember what the Lord has done. So often we read in the scriptures, remember, remember, just again and again, don't forget. And uh, Lord, we do not want to forget your faithfulness to us, Lord, and how you have ensured, because of your great love, that there has been a gospel witness. In this area, Lord, for even over a hundred years, this building's been around for a hundred years, uh, but even before that, there was work happening, Lord, just as a sign of your great love and of your purpose in Christ to save the lost, Lord. In this, what was a rural, remote part of the world, on the tip of Africa, Lord, uh, you sent missionaries uh, many years ago uh, to reach those who had never heard about Christ. Lord, we thank you that we continue in those steps as a church, and that, Lord, we are beneficiaries of their work, and, Lord, may we continue to be faithful in carrying the flame and carrying the baton as the years go ahead, Lord. Lord, we want to bring our dear sister to you this morning, Kish, Lord. We are sad to hear how unwell she is, Lord, and, Lord, we do pray for the doctors who are treating her, even as we can. Lord, we all know how uh, anxious uh, it is when we hear uh, the word ventilator, Lord. We just uh, commit the family to you, Lord God. We are feeling so much uh, stress and anxiety at the moment. We commit them to you, Lord. We pray that you would give them your peace, Lord God. Uh, peace in the storm, uh, peace in the most severe trial. Lord. Lord, we just pray for Tish as well as she lies there. We pray, Lord God, that your hand would be upon her, that your hand of healing would be with her, Lord God. To, to you, and we know, Lord God, that your ways are perfect in everything, Lord God. And so, Lord, we just commit it to you. We do ask for healing, and Lord, we know that you will do what is best and what is right. So, we just bring it before you today, and the whole family, and all those in our church who you know Trish well. And uh, Lord, we uh, just pray, Lord God, that you uh, will be near to us all. Lord, we do thank you for. Uh, the many birthdays that are being celebrated this week for Auntie Ruth and for Dylan and Henry and Ray and Audrey, Emmanuel and, uh, and Joseph. Lord, we thank you for each one. We pray a special blessing on them for this uh, week ahead, the special uh, days that they will be celebrating various milestones. Thank you, Lord God, for each one of them. And we also want to uh, bring uh, those in our family focus here this morning for Alan and Linda Hewitt. That Linda is well enough again today. We see her again our service. We thank you, Lord God, for sustaining her through another difficult time. And we just pray, Lord God, that you continue to bless Alan and Linda. Thank you for their, their service in the church and what they mean to us. And Lord, for you know any challenges that they face, Lord God, we just commit them to you. Lord, we pray that you bless them and that you be very near to them. Lord, we think of Alec Woods as well. And, you know, Lord, his needs, Lord, his ongoing uh, health issues that he's had for some time, we uh, just bring him to you. We pray, Lord God, that he would know you in his weakness, Lord, and that your strength would be made perfect in his weakness as he feels uh, aches and pains, Lord God, and that you would draw him <coughs> into him. He would be reminded of how you suffered for him and that by your wounds, Lord, he has been healed. And so, Lord, we commit him to you. Your blessing on him. We also, uh, Lord, want to pray for Megan Jackson and as she travels this week uh, to Kwazulu Natal to for that prayer retreat with Sim. We do pray, Lord God, that you would be with her, that you would show yourself to her, that you would encourage her, give her direction for the future, and a real sense of, of your nearness to her and your purpose for her life. Lord God, so we pray, Lord, that you uh, would keep her safe as she travels. Even as she spends some time with you, Lord God, 
devoted specifically to prayer and to uh, meditation, Lord, we do pray that you would draw very close uh, to her. And then, Lord, we pray for Annie Jones, Auntie Annie, Lord, who we haven't seen for so long because of her, her age and her ill health. We do pray, Lord God, that she in these years, Lord, these uh, twilight years of her life, Lord God, that you'd be very near to her as her body wastes away, Lord God, even as her mind is, is uh, finding increasingly uh, difficult to uh, just cope with remembering things. And Lord, we just bring her before you today, that you would just know your love and your peace that you would strengthen her, Lord. We commit our coming uh, general meeting this coming week, Lord, to you as well. We pray for your, uh, for your direction as a church, for your purpose, Lord, as we discuss the running of the church. We pray, Lord God, that you bless our meeting together. So thank you, Lord, for each one here today. You know every need here, Lord. I've mentioned some people by name, but Lord, you know each one here. Uh, those, Lord, with special needs, with uh, people who have needs in their marriages and their health, their home, with their children, with their parents even, uh, Lord, financial challenges and many difficulties people are facing. You hear every prayer and you know each one here today. And so, Lord God, we pray that you would just uh, be very uh, attentive to our prayers, Lord God, as you always are, and that we would know, Lord, that you are at work in every situation and that, Lord God, you would come to our help and to our rescue in our time of need. So, bless our time further now. As the Sunday school leave now, we pray for them too, the teachers and the children alike, that you, Lord God, would use their time together to impart your great truths into these young minds that are like sponges and so receptive, Lord, to your word. We pray, Lord God, that you would use the teachers and that you would bless their time together. So be with us now, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And call our musicians up to the in one more song. And as I mentioned in the prayer, the younger ones can leave. Sunday school as we want to go out, and we will turn to God's word together on this song. Let's stand and let's praise our God together. <laughs>
do a reading from Romans 16. The Pastor Kevin's going to be preaching on Romans 16. <coughs> I recommend you to our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Centria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, and to give her any help she may need from you. For she has been a great help to many people, including me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me, not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my friend Epineus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junius, my relatives who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampliatus, whom I love in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachus. Greet Apellus, tested and approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my relative. Greet those in the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Greet the Synchrius, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brothers with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister Olympus, and all the saints with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Timothy, my dear fellow worker, sends his greetings to you, as do Lucius, Jason, and Sosipata, my relatives. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the, in the Lord. Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, sends you his greetings. Pastor Kevin. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just bring us together before you now, Lord. We pray for the word, we pray it comes out with power, Lord, comes out with your spirit, Lord Jesus. We just thank you for him, thank you for your servant, Lord. I pray we'd have ears to hear, Lord, and hearts to be open wide to your word today. May we walk out here, change people, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> we are waiting through the book of Romans, and uh, when Ray agreed to read this morning. I think he didn't realize the names that we were involved in the reading this morning. <laughs> I thought there was a stroke of brilliance on my part. <laughs> <laughs> so, picking names, we were told, and thank you for being uh, God's to us. us. In Romans chapter 16, our last chapter in the book of Romans. And perhaps sometimes when you're reading through a book like this, like Romans or others, and you get to these final greetings, a whole lot of names you can't pronounce. Uh, people you don't know, places you've never heard of, uh, you might be tempted to skip over them, uh, but I encourage you not to, because there is such work and value, even a passage like this, uh, that is uh, just so valuable for us today. Relationships at work, that is what we're going to think about this morning. Uh, relationships at work. Human relations, uh, relations that we are involved in, can be rather complicated. Uh, they can be tricky to negotiate, uh, difficult to maintain. Uh, we are complex beings. Uh, simultaneously, we are wonderfully made, uh, and yet, simultaneously, we are also thoroughly broken and sinful. So we have this ability to do great good, to do all kinds of, of great things, to love in all kinds of ways, to acts of real kindness, uh, to demonstrate gestures of, and do things of, of goodwill and service, uh, to be uh, graciously gentle, to be patient with one another, uh, forgiving, kind, all of these things uh, that we know we should be considerate, all these things that Jesus would want us to be, and the kind of people that we know we ought to be. And yet, at the same time, we can hate in the most selfish ways, uh, we can be unkind, we can be intolerant of one another, uh, even cruel in all kinds of ways. And that's just in the car on the way to church in the morning. Uh, and we can be unloving even towards those 
who those people who we love and care so much about. Uh, and you, you see this play out in the home where we enjoy the closest relations. Even the best of homes go through difficult times. We know we talk about things like sibling rivalry. Uh, I know there's a lot of siblings here this morning, and I know there are some siblings that don't even talk to each other uh, in, in our families because of rivalry, even as adults. Uh, selfishly, we jostle for attention, uh, we, we want dominance on one another, it's not fair, uh, that's mine, we hear all these kinds of things as parents, and we, we wish that our children would mature and grow up, and then we become mature grown-up uh, adults, and then we find ways to fight with one another, even as adults. Husbands and wives, did you ever think, those of you who've been married for some time, uh, that it would be so difficult and challenging and even painful in, in marriage? When you walk down the aisle, did you think it was going to be as difficult as it is or was, or has been in, in the past? There is nothing that exposes our <coughs> sinful hearts and our need for a saviour like marriage and like our human relations that we have for one another. You know, in a marriage, you have the perfect person, right? You have the person of your dream. There they are. That's the person for you. That's the person that you love and adore. And in marriage, you have all in the scriptures so many things that guide and lead us about how to, to live in, in, a, in a happy home and how to have a happy marriage. Uh, it's, it's like a love incubator, isn't it? And everything is perfect there. It should be. And yet, even in that, we find that can somehow contamination creeps in. And even in our marriages, we go through difficult times. And we find ourselves often in settings, not even if maybe you're not married here this morning, for whatever reason, uh, you have been married and you're no longer, or you're still planning to get married, or maybe you're planning never to get married. We find ourselves in all kinds of settings, in, in relationships with people, in the home, at work, at school, with other people, where we are forced to dig deep, to go the extra mile, to deploy all the soft skills, uh, soft social skills that we need to get <coughs> along with other people. Relationships are hard work to make them work, but relationships can work, relationships must work, and relationships do work. It is really relationships, you know why they're so difficult? They indeed are the hardest place to live out your faith, to live out your Christian faith. You can give up all the vices. You can stop the drinking and the smoking and the pornography and the whatever else you might be, might be your vice. I'm telling you those are the easiest things to stop. Try and rectify your relationships with those people that you don't talk to anymore. Try and fix your marriage overnight. Try and reconcile a, a, some uh, broken relationship that you've had with somebody in your own way. Get along with that difficult person. Then the real hard work begins. Hence, we find ourselves in the scriptures here with so much help, so much guidance, so much uh, to, to help us and to show us the way that we should go. Churches are not exempt. The family of God is not exempt. It takes intentional effort to be part of a meaningful uh, relationship and relationships and a community to contribute to the life of the church and the well-being of the church. As it does in the home, in the workplace, at school, likewise, even in the church, as we see from our passage, relationships can be difficult and yet relationships can work as well. We know that the early church was, was no different. To us, to us here today, we, we read of all kinds of, of antisocial behavior in the church. We see things like divisions being addressed, uh, idleness being addressed, uh, people who are going around being busy, but not with good works, but with being gossipers, going around busy, uh, putting their nose in other people's business, as we say, and, and uh, going around gossiping about others. The early church had its problems. They were not, uh, not always one just this big happy family. Uh, there was disunity. There were fights and disagreements. There was backsliding. The discipline was needed to bring order and to bring stability back into the church. And there are many reminders that we find in the scriptures uh, 
telling us, uh, uh, telling the early church even how to treat one another, tells us that such attitudes uh, were, were, were not always good attitudes were not always presents. How we must love one another, how we must care for one another, how we must forgive one another. All these things are reminders that somehow, why were they mentioned? Why were they being addressed? Because they were an issue in that early church. They had the issues as well. It was not just a perfect, happy family. And so we find that in our passage, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, like a window into the, the early church, a lot of what it was like to be part of the early church. Why would people be reminded of the fruits of the Spirit if they were exemplifying them in every way? Because they needed to be reminded that they needed to care, to love one another as they were. But notice again in this farewell passage, you've seen it also in Romans, and you find it all over the place in the Bible, but in this farewell passage, the love and the warmth uh, of fellowship, despite whatever challenges existed, uh, the close relationships that existed among them, the bonds that existed among them, uh, between Paul and the people, they were brothers and sisters. This is why I was joking when I said, Aren't you read this? You're all part of the family, isn't it? Because we are brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And Paul takes time to, to mention and to greet a lot of people by name. And he commends some of them for their work. Most of them are unknown to us. You've probably some, maybe you've never heard those names before. If you've never read the book of Romans. Uh, and many of them we don't know. They're unknown to us. There's no other mention of these people elsewhere in the Bible. Uh, they didn't go off and do something amazing. They, they, they were important Christians who Paul mentions by name. Uh, and yet the, the fact that he mentions them by name tells us that these people were significant people. The first up we have is Phoebe. And that's our sister, Phoebe. Uh, you know that this month is Women's Month. Uh, and in a small way it's uh, yes, our country's way of trying to highlight the struggle of women in our country and the many challenges that they face, uh, <coughs> you know, gender-based violence and inequality and discrimination. And there are so many issues relating to women in our country and we need things like women's life to try and highlight those sorts of things. I think it's also an attempt to try and uh, stress and to show the importance, the important role that women play in society. That we should be thankful for the women in our lives and even in our country. But Romans goes a whole lot further than just a month from the year. This is a consistent thing throughout the year. Uh, it should be uh, that we appreciate our women and that we fight against the many injustices that we see uh, perpetrated against uh, women. Phoebe was a deaconess in the early church. The same word for deacon is used here. She's a deaconess in the early church, a servant who was the first person that is commended by Paul. This is lady, uh, Phoebe. She is mentioned elsewhere, but Paul mentions her here, and then I'm going to focus here. But, but Paul himself, he highlights the important role that this woman played. She was a foreigner to Rome, uh, from the port city of St. Crea, which is near Corinth, which is in what we know now as Greece. The important thing though here is that she is a sister in Christ. This is your sister, he's reminding him. She's from a different part of the world. She's not native to Rome. Uh, she's not a Roman as such. She's a Greek. Uh, but we think, before you think of any of those other distinctions, remember she is your sister. And he reminds him of that. Apparently she was a person who was entrusted with the important task of taking the letter of Romans to the Romans. She was the one entrusted with that important task. And it shows us the important role of such women uh, in the early church and the work that they do. Uh, speaking of, of deacons in 1 Timothy 3 verse 11, it says that the women are to be worthy of respect. Worthy of respect. Now that tells us something, that women, in fact, that there is such a thing as respect, meaning honor and recognition for women who are worthy. Women are to be respected and honored uh, because they are worthy of those who are worthy of it. As likewise, men, 
and be worthy or unworthy of such respect. Simply because you're a man doesn't mean that you're worthy of respect. Respect is something that should be earned. But from time to time, even now as a church, we have to defend our, even our church's stance on, on having women in our church as, as deacons. Simply put, I was to say it's, it's in the Bible, we find Phoebe as a, a deaconess. It's a function of service to the church. And this is what she was doing. She was <coughs> serving the church. It wasn't about titles. It wasn't about a hierarchy in the church. It wasn't about her occupying some position of leadership in the church. It was about her serving the church. And this we see coming through. I don't think she cared much about the title, to be honest. I think for her, the woman like Phoebe, as for a woman in our church, it's not about the title and the position in the church. It's about serving the Lord's people in the church. And we are thankful to the Lord for many ladies who serve in our church. Some recognize as deacons, some not recognized, but all serving the church. Deacons don't, you know, have eldership oversight or responsibilities, uh, but men and women are appointed to serve as, and for the word in the Greek is deacon, to deacon, to serve the practical needs that a church has, such as admin, in this case, carrying this letter, very practical need that existed, uh, maintenance, care, there's many things that take place in the life of the church, behind the scenes that have to take place by the people who serve in our church, that the ministry of the word can run free, without any hindrance, and that prayer, without any obstacles, can continue and not be neglected. Our churches, honestly, would not uh, stand to be anything close to what we have as Mount of and churches in general that I've seen <clears throat> without the vital role that women play in serving the many diverse ministries of our church. Phoebe was no exception. She is not an exception to the norm or to the rule. Phoebe is not an exception. She is not the only lady that is mentioned and commended to in this passage. Uh, we will come to others later. But Paul instructs us, welcome her, he says, and receive her in the Lord. He says to Timothy somewhere, he says, don't let them look down on you because you are young. It's with a similar voice that, that Paul says to the church in Romans, welcome her and receive her. Don't look down on her because she isn't a Roman, because she isn't a Jew, because she's a woman. Don't look down on her. Receive her. Welcome her in the Lord. Receive her as your sister. Offer her hospitality. Don't offer her discrimination. <clears throat> she is a worthy woman, and she helps. Uh, she was a helper to Paul and to many others. She was a patron to them, or a, a benefactor. Some of the versions uh, translated. Uh, she practically helped, probably monetarily, enable Paul and others to do the work that. They she, that, they, that they were doing. And she will undoubtedly have needed help as a traveller. It's quite a distance, it would have been a difficult journey for her to make. Um, and he says, please help her with whatever needs she might have when she comes to you, which they are to give her um, whatever she might need, including acceptance, uh, including practical needs that she might have needed. Receive and help her as your sister in the Lord is what he wants to remind her of. And that we should be reminded of here. We have sisters in the Lord who may have needs as they serve the Lord that we can help them. Having commended her about this, he goes on to greet various other people in the church of Rome. Why do we greet each other? Why do we greet one another? Have you ever thought about it? It's not a strange thing that we do. Uh, waving to each other, high five, fist bumps, handshakes, the shoulder butt, uh, hugs. Uh, whatever it is, uh, there's various ways that we that we greet one another. You, you don't see the moons and monkeys doing these things, do you? You don't see them walking up to each other and handshakes, half far, waving to each other from one tree to another tree. You don't see animals doing things like that. Uh, you say things like "Good morning," uh, or "How are you?" Or well, South Africa, the universal term that covers all of that is houses. You know, it's just the, the universal term that we use. You don't see animals waving to each other and handshaking and half hours and offering one another kisses and fist pumps. Because we're not related to animals. We're not like them. Even an elephant that is exceptionally intelligent, it's a 
herd, it's a communal animal, it's a, a herd animal, it lives in a community, and not in isolation. They probably come the closest to some form of <coughs> greeting one another with their trunks, and, uh, and even that doesn't come close to what we do as people. And yet, universally, it's not restricted to one culture or to one part of the world, universally, globally, around the world, even isolated tribes in the middle of a jungle somewhere, even they have some form of greeting one another. And there's this custom of greeting, this is more than just a custom or a culture uh, isolated to a few. We greet because we're not animals. We greet because we are civilized. We greet one another because we are highly relational and we are intelligent beings with the capability of doing good. How do people show that they are displeased with you? How do you show someone that you're not happy with them about something? Well, you just don't greet them, right? <laughs> kind of look the other way when you drive past in your car, when you just you see them in the aisle in the shop and you go look for something else in the other part. You just don't greet them. Or perhaps you want it to be a little bit more obvious that you know, for your displeasure for them. You, you don't greet them. You make sure that they see that you see them and you just look away. And that is just... Either they know they're in trouble with you, that they've done uh, something wrong. You really hope that they notice. Uh, and you feel offended, don't you? When Kevin walks down the aisle and he doesn't greet you on the way past, he greets somebody else, you feel, you know, somewhat offended because he didn't greet me this morning. They didn't recognize us. And, uh, you know, you see that. We feel offended when somebody doesn't greet us or, or wave to us. It's why always when I get up here, I make sure I greet you. Just to cover all my bases before uh, we carry on with this service. It's how you honor somebody, isn't it? That's why we greet. We, we honor and we show somebody their, their worth, that, that, that you are recognizing them as worthy and honorable. And that's why we never used to tip hands as a way of showing respect to somebody. Uh, and the tradition of waves, or bows, handshakes, it really goes back to the earliest years of human civilization. Uh, it's a sign that I come in peace. I'm not carrying a weapon. That's why we handshake. That's why we wave at people. I come in peace. I'm not going to draw a sword on you or shoot my bow and arrow at you. That means I mean you no harm. I come in peace. Hello. And that's why we greet one another. Greetings and gestures show that love and peace exist among us. And that is why Jesus' betrayal with a kiss from a friend, from one of his own, from one of the twelve, from Judas, by a friend, and I put that inverted comma, why Judas' betrayal with a kiss was particularly bitter and twisted its deception, its duplicity, its lie with the goal of treachery and the beginning of Jesus' <coughs> suffering. Twenty-two times in our passage this morning, the word greet or greetings is used. Uh, and more people, of course, are mentioned in the greeting. Sometimes it greets more than one person with a greeting. But clearly, this word greet is important in this passage. Men and women here are being greeted and described as my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And as you read these verses, you see that there is mutual respect and appreciation for these people. Paul and these believers, that, that's necessary for relationships to work. Respect and appreciation. Love and respect for other people. People who are made in the image of God. We must recognize that you're made in the image of God. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. Right. And that's why you are worthy of respect and honor and that sense of worth. And peace and love because you're not as I'm not, we're not always that lovable, is it? Sometimes the peace is broken, and as we greet, it's a way of us reconciling that relationship where maybe something was said or done wrong, that you greet the person. It's almost like saying, I forgive you, can we continue as friends or brothers and sisters? And so there's so much that happens in a simple thing like a greeting. And it's how you honor the dignity and worth of someone. You're recognizing them worthy of that recognition. And so this is why we greet. So all of these believers, the, 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 uh, these believers that 
and, and the better relationships for them to, to work. As you read these verses, you, you see this uh, respect and appreciation that is necessary for these relationships to work. Respect and appreciation are come in many forms. And you see it, James. It's not only a case of, of good relationships at work, in the title of this message, relationships at work, it's not only the fact that good relationships uh, work, but also working relationships work. And he mentions Priscilla and Aquila are co-workers in Christ Jesus. Other people who see and have made their home available for the church to use, to meet in. Uh, this was in the infancy of the church, of course, and, and during a time of, of persecution when the church had to go, was forced to go underground. They couldn't meet in public places or public buildings or in church buildings that have barely been built yet. Uh, but they met in temple squares and they met in, at, the, at the synagogues and in various public buildings where they would meet. But there were times when churches had to meet in homes as well because of persecution uh, that had happened. The church was forced out of the public eye to go uh, underground. But they went, that's not the only place that they met, but in this case he mentions that are significant that they had opened their home for the church to meet. There are other examples. In verse, uh, in verse 8, we have Mary, who has worked hard for you, he tells them. Peter and Lydimus, our fellow worker in Christ. There's Trifina and Trifosa, who describe as workers in the Lord, and Ursus, who, who worked hard in the Lord. And then there's Rufus's mother. Now, you're not given her name. Mrs. Rufus, can we call it? And Rufus's mother, who had been a mother to me as well, Paul says. She's been a mother to get used her motherly nature to, to be a mother to Paul, to help him. He mentions Timothy, my co-worker. And then there's the strange verse between the two. It says, I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter. I think I thought Paul wrote the letter. Well, Tertius was Paul's scribe who was writing for him. Remember, Paul's you think his eyes went bad uh, at, at some point in his life and he probably needed Tertius to write this letter for him. Even he gets in on the farewell and he says, I agree to do. Uh, and he, he, he puts that verse in verse 22. And then there's Gaius who, who served through hospitality, uh, Paul and the early church. So there are many relationships here that are, are mentioned in these few verses that were really practical working relationships the people were shoulder to shoulder together in the trenches. These are not just casual <coughs> social associations, they're just friends, yeah, and this is so much more. We're working together. It was no less than social, but it was also so much more than social as people were serving the Lord together. You see, the church is not just a place, it's not to be a place full of empty sentiments, a lounge to come in and, and loaf about. Together we serve the Lord and we do His will together. And we all have different gifts. Uh, this is a, a workplace where we come together and to serve the Lord together with our different gifts and talents to serve Christ in the body. We also say, see that there is a deep commitment and sacrifice for each other. Uh, some even went so far as that they risked their lives for me and the work that was done to serve each other at a cost. They risked their lives. So there was, uh, there were working relationships, there was commitment uh, to one another and great sacrifice. Throughout this passage you see, feel the gratitude and the appreciation for these people. What is, what, and, and what they have done. He says in verse 4, not only are that all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. There's such gratitude and warmth in these passages. The churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Uh, who's, and it is a, 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 a Pelis who, whose fidelity to Christ has stood the test uh, and again just recognizing him and thanking the Lord for it. How thankful are you for people in your life? How thankful are you for the people in your life? Do you, do you, they know it? That's perhaps the other question we ask. Do they know it? You might be thankful, but do they know that you're thankful to the Lord for them? Do you give thanks to the Lord for them as you remember them in your prayers? Another 
aspect that we notice in our passage. Notice the love, the intimacy, and the affection that are shown for them. Look how he describes it in such deeply personal terms. My dear friend, in, in verse 5, my, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me, and she in prison time together, <coughs> not for stealing sweets at the shop, but for serving the Lord, for being witnesses, simply for being Christians. They had been in jail together, they had served time together. My dear friend in the Lord, he says in verse 8, in verse 9, my dear friend, verse 11, my fellow Jew, verse 12, my dear friend, verse 13, who has been a mother to me, 16, I greet one another with a holy kiss. These words should really jump out of the page and challenge us about how close are we to those who we call our family in Christ. How appreciative are we for one another? I think mean, COVID, COVID helps us a lot in this, isn't it? About what's really important in life. Is everything else was stripped away, and we realized how important being with, together with one another, seeing one another, having relationships with one another is so important. And so this passage shows us that these relationships, church relationships, should not be shallow and superficial, casual associations, but deep and personal. Can we get into each other's lives? I had to chuckle with myself the other day and I heard somebody say, oh, we went to go and visit somebody for a cup of coffee and about five hours later we were still at their house. And I thought, yeah, that's great. That's how it's meant to be as we share time together. Can we share in a Christian life together? And finally, I want you to notice the, the rich diversity of this church. It wasn't that they were all the same. And yet it stands as one body. We see in this passage Jews, and you can tell from the names that I mentioned, these are Gentiles as well. There are Jews and Gentiles. There are male and there are females in the church. There are all kinds of nationalities that are mentioned in this church. They have all come together as one family in Christ Jesus. We have wealthy people, like Phoebe, for example. She was most likely a wealthy, maybe even a businesswoman of some way. She was able to be a benefactor to others, to help others, assist others in practical needs. We have important people I mentioned, like Erastus, who is the city's director of public works in Corinth. That was a very high position in the very important city of Corinth. He's mentioned by name and sending his greetings. You see, that's not really that important, is it? How important the man is. The fact is, he's part of the body of Christ. Some of you have occupied very important positions in society, and some of you very lowly positions. But we remain one in Christ. We remain very different in terms of our complexions, in terms of our past, in terms of our mother tongues, uh, in terms of where we were born and where we were raised. Very diverse people who have been brought together in Christ Jesus. No doubt in this passage there were poor there among them too. There were recent converts, as we see there are those who have been on the road for a very long time. Those who are outstanding and those who are just ordinary Christians living out their extraordinary <coughs> Christian life. And they all come together to form one body in Christ. Heads, hands, feet, toes, they all come together as one body. All importantly, they form the body of Christ. And for our relationships to work, we have to work at our relationships. It takes time, it takes effort, but we have to put the needs of one another first, showing our appreciation for one another, showing our respect for one another, honor one another uh, in the things that we do and we say, and making sacrifices to serve one another, putting the needs of others ahead of our own, that we can be the kind of community, a dynamic Christian community that Jesus Christ would want us to be. I can tell you these people were not without their faults. These people were not without their difficulties. Paul's addressed some of them in his letter, hasn't he? We've been through those difficult passages where he's had to address issues of attitude and issues of uh, bad actions, negative actions, mm -hmm. things that they've done wrong. And he's addressed those things but they remain the family of God, the body of Christ, as we do too. We have to sometimes forgive, and sometimes we have to move on. And sometimes we have to ask for forgiveness too. 
And I think you're not, you're the only one who's in a position who has to forgive all the time. Recognize the fact that sometimes you need to ask for forgiveness too, that you're in the wrong. As much as you see others in the wrong, you're in the wrong, just as much. It's that thing, you know, you point your finger at somebody, there's at least three fingers pointing back at you, and there's one finger pointing up. Remember the grace of God that has been shown to you. When you're ready to point your finger at somebody, remember what Christ has done for you. Remember, look up what Jesus Christ has done to forgive you. If you can forgive you, you need to forgive one another and love, appreciate, and respect one another, what the Lord has done in our lives. Let's pray that God will help us. <coughs> Lord, we thank you for your word to us today. Once again, reminding us of a very difficult area of human relationships. We sometimes, Lord, it is difficult to be part of the community. It's so much easier to live in isolation in so many ways. But that's not what you want from us, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that you've called us into community. You laid down your life for the church, the bride, the bride of Christ, made up of many different people. Thank you, Lord, for one another. I give you thanks today, Lord, for this Mount and New Baptist Church, Lord. Thank you for each person here today who has indeed been so close and dear to us, Lord God. The relationships that exist among one another, Lord, and the brothers and sisters. Often we, we say it's true, Lord God, that our church family is closer than our natural family. And we thank you, Lord, for the bonds that you have put among us, the bonds of peace. We thank you, Lord God, for each person who serves so faithfully, who sacrifices time and effort and energy, makes all kinds of sacrifices, even financially, contributing uh, to the needs of others and to the work of the Lord, Shia Lord. As you have given many gifts, Lord, and as they exercise those gifts, we give you thanks, Lord God, for your work in their lives. And Lord, we pray, we recognize there is so much work that is still needed to be done. In each of us. We see it in our homes, in our marriages, in our relationships with others. Help us, Lord, perhaps there's somebody here today that's been eaten up with unforgiveness, Lord. You just cannot forgive, you just cannot let go. Oh Lord God, we thank you for the forgiveness that you that you died for, Lord. You went to the full extent of forgiveness, Lord, that you laid down your life, the innocent for the guilty. The one who was without any blame was all the blame was placed upon you, Lord God. You, you, Lord God, the sin of the world was placed upon you. All our sin, all our guilt, Lord, so that we could be forgiven. Help us to forgive, Lord. Help us to reach out to our enemy, to reach out to those who we find it difficult to get along with, to love and to accept them as they are, and to love them enough, Lord God, to help them to be better Christians and more like you. So help us, Lord, we pray in our human relationships here in our church, in our homes, in our family, at work, with our difficult colleagues, with our school, with your difficult teachers or difficult friends and maybe difficult students and teachers here. Help us, Lord God, to be more like Jesus in a way that we relate to one another. Thank you, Lord, for your words us today. Bless us, we pray. With these things that I will ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Oh, church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For oh, now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. The shield of faith and belt of truth will stand.
Thank you. 